Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from where you are joining us. Uh, my name is Erika Castellanos. I am the Executive Director of GATE, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you today to this webinar on the impact of regional and international human rights mechanism on trans rights. Uh, the webinar, we will have uh, some excellent uh, panelists who will be presenting first uh, uh, around the findings from GATE's recently published report on the impact of regional and international human rights mechanism on trans rights. And then we will have a discussion around how different regional and international human me mechanisms are dealing with gender identity related issues, but also listening to partner organizations about the work they are doing in this in very important topic and the issues that are affecting our lives and our organizations currently. Uh, we do have a question and answer um, that where you can pose your questions. Please use the Q&A button to post any questions that you might have um, for uh, our panelists as they present. At the end, we will be able to have time to answer those questions. Um, Thank you very much again for attending. We are uh, recording this webinar and it will be shared afterwards. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start. We're gonna have our first speaker, uh, Nora Norala, who worked with us in developing uh, this uh, publication. Uh, Nora is a transgender Egyptian researcher and consultant uh, with focusing on digital rights, Islamic class, sexual and bodily freedoms, and international and regional human rights mechanisms. She has worked in different NGOs, including Cairo 52, Legal Research Institute, Human Rights Watch, Article 19, and the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. She has authored various articles and publications, including One Through Sharia, A Historical Background, and Al Karana, History of Sex Working in Modern Egypt Between Legalization and Criminalization. Nora, please uh, uh, welcome and thank you for working with Gate on this publication. And uh, Nora will be presenting to us the findings of the publication. Thank you a lot, Erica, and thank you for giving me the chance today and welcome everybody. Uh, we have a very brief presentation for you, a bit of uh, at ease, I would say, for you to get excited about the publication. Uh, everyone can see my screen, I assume. So the publication we wanted to work on uh, to try to have a very comprehensive understanding of how international regional humanity mechanism can assess trans rights in the current atmosphere. And we know the current atmosphere have been uh, faced with a lot of anti-gender narratives that works on undermining the concept of trans rights as human rights. So this publication was uh, developed with uh, qualitative co consultation with uh, members of the trans community, international members like globally, and also experts on this topic. So like, the beginning, like, we we'll just want to reaffirm something that we're not here to invent new rights. We're not here to talk about something out of ordinary. These are fundamental human rights that just being extended to people uh, under the gender identity clause. So these rights include in the publication that we focused on, like fundamental human rights, like right to privacy, right to education, right to health, non-discrimination, protection of violence, and so on and so on. Uh, we worked uh, to provide like an overview of how every system work on extending these fundamental human rights. And also we looked at how national jurisdictions have been uh, developing its own uh, like case law or like development, uh, its own extension on these human uh, fundamental human rights. If we, if the people who already have the report or have looked at the report, you will see that we have looked at into different human rights systems, like uh, the inter-American system, the international one, the UN system, the European one, the Car Caribbean one, which is not uh, a system on its own, but more like of two courts working together, an African system and Asian. And uh, in addition to the UGART uh, UPI plus 10 and UPI. 
uh, this is a little ranking that I like we found like I found like based on like the findings like that I thought that is applicable to how these systems have interacted with the issue of gender identity. And when I say interaction, that means binding and non-binding opinions. So there is binding opinions that may come out of like a regional court or like a committee or so on. And there is also observations, reports and so on and so on. The inter-American system has been proven to be one of the most proactive systems, like when it comes to this and like, and for the, for the people who have the report, like this is not in the order of the report, but like you can find the inter-American system, more details you can find in there, but you can find uh, things like the advi advisory opinion 2417, which has done a lot in extending uh, rights under the uh, Inter-American Charter of Human Rights and other uh, human rights uh, charters in the system to the issue of gender identity, including protection of violence and non-discrimination and so on. Vicky Herdenaz uh, versus uh, Honduras. Uh, this is a very important case because uh, the, char the charter that is related to women's rights, the, this is, was the first time that uh, protection under the women's rights uh, charter was also extended to trans women and people with feminine uh, transgender uh, identities. And there is also like the system also proactively issue reports uh, on people on transgender and gender diverse person status and so on. Uh, the challenges related to the implementation that you will also find in the report are mostly related to uh, that's uh, the Anglo-Latin divide or like something that is more in the colonial history of like the regions that the system oversees. Uh, countries that has a more colonial history with the British are less inclined to work with the system than countries with the Spanish colonial history. Of course, this is not a one rule fits all, like every country has its own context, but this is one of the things that researchers always point out that this is one of the things. Uh, a second thing that you will find as a common theme across all of these systems when it comes to implementation, that they depend too much on the honor system that each country can accept or can decide to ignore, even if it, when it's binding, which uh, because these are, at the end of the day, our human rights mechanism don't have an executive branch to enforce uh, their decisions. They do have mechanism to enforce it, but sometimes it, it depends on how the country perceives this uh, recommendations or opinion to be beneficial for them. The international or the UN human rights system has also been active in extending its the rights under its various human rights um, uh, mechanisms to trans people and gender diverse, people of gender diverse. You will find like uh, the CCPR committee, for example, in G versus Australia, General Committee number 23 from CCR, and very uh, 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 different uh, resolutions coming from the UN General Assembly and so on. The UN human rights system has its own unique problem with implementations, and it comes all kind of narrows down to cultural relevancy, like a lot of countries, and we, we see two camps that have been developing in the past years. One that is very anti-Soji and one is pro-Soji and mostly comprised of countries in Latin America and, and, uh, and Europe and Western Europe and the US and Canada and so on. The other, the other camp that is very anti-Soji comes from uh, uh, countries, uh, members of the Organization of Islamic Corporations, uh, the members, uh, members of the African bloc, as it's called, and uh, countries re the, under the influence of Russia or China and so on. Of course, this is, again, not one rule fits all, but it's good to have this understanding to understand why the implementation may be lagging in some countries, uh, despite the system itself issuing very, like, number of uh, recommendations or general comments or observations to countries that encourage them to have more proactive approach, especially when it comes to right to self-determination, for example, or right to access health, gender affirming health care, and understanding the need of the child, like, uh, and so on and so on. The system, uh, the European system itself, like people may think that is, is one of the best systems, but it has had its own shortcoming in the past years. Uh, it, it, of course, it has been like it's one of the first systems that has been engaging on the issue of gender identity back back in the day. Like the first cases, they use very outdated terms, transsexuals, and like the one through our 
biological sex and so on, but now they are, have been improving. But in the same time, despite having cases like X and Y versus Ro Romania, which like basically struck down like uh, some aspect of like having surgeries to gain the access to legal gender organization and like Schlumpf for, uh, versus Switzerland, which focus on like uh, insurance coverance and AM and others versus Russia, which is also recent, which focused on giving trans parents the right to parenthood uh, even after transitioning and so on. They are still very shy when it comes to like uh, explicitly the European Court of Human Rights, at least, to explicitly say that the right to self-determination is something that should every country follow under the, this system. And the European Court of Human Rights is quite slow when it comes to developing this kind of jurisdiction over trans rights, as it, take, uh, it took it 20 years to acknowledge that trans people have the right to legal gender organization, to striking down uh surgeries and like and so on as a as a as a condition to access this kind of uh, mechanism uh despite this the council of europe and other uh, european entities has been issuing resolutions reports and so on and working uh effortlessly like to expand the right under the european charter and also in different countries especially uh newly members to the eu and also uh, and also countries in the neighboring atmosphere of uh, of the eu of course, the system is not related to the European Union, but this is a, more of the Council of Europe, which is two different entities for the people who may, may be confused about this, but you will find this also detailed in the report. Uh, then we have the Caribbean, as I said, it's not it's a sub-regional system, I would say. It's divided into two uh, court entities, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and the Caribbean Court of Justice, and they have been uh, in the recent year or like the five years or so have been more proactive when it comes to decriminalization, especially. Uh, they have uh, in the last years alone, like we heard about uh, St. San Ke Kittens and Navis, uh, but also we had a specific case on like uh, the criminalization of uh, transgender people, which was a cross-dressing case, which is Quincy McQueen, like it's a long name as you see. So like, uh, if you're interested, you'll find more information about it, which happened in 2018. And this was under the Caribbean Court of uh, Justice. And the Caribbean Court of Justice did expand the right to privacy and, uh, and non-discrimination, other in this case, to the transgender community of Guana. And actually Guana did follow up and the parliament did remove the law entirely in 2021. So this is a clear example of how a, a, a regional court can work in this uh, uh, to advance trans rights. Uh, the African system is uh, maybe perhaps a lot of people know how the African system can be the most disappointing when it comes to, to these issues. They only have issued one non-binding resolution, resolution 275, which calls to, for the states to take more proactive uh, approach in protecting people from violence, trans, uh, trans LGBT people in general, but the system has been criticized a lot by LGBT activists for the lagging of action when it comes to any kind of implementation. Furthermore, the African uh, Union assembly, assembly have attacked the African Commission of Human Rights, which is responsible for the system, for allowing the uh, LGBT organization to register in the system. And they had to pull that out. So a lot of African leaders, at the, uh, when this resolution came out and other things, attacked the system for uh, for uh, imposing non-African ideologies on them, which uh, many African leaders sadly still like uh, promote this idea that uh, being LGBT is a non-African uh, approach. However, in theory, in theory, and this is what has not been tested yet because there has been no transgender cases or uh, communication in front of the system to discuss on gender identity. But in theory, the system can be extended to people under the clause of like others, which they have done before in uh, issues of the rights of disabilities and so on. Finally, the Asian, Asian system, which is the newest and has not been tested generally in human rights. But the, sadly, when it was being established, it had a lot of clauses that may undermine any cases related to transgender rights in the future, as it relied on like uh, giving a lot of states a lot of lean way when it comes to their cultures and traditions to deny human rights and so on, which something countries like Indonesia, for example, or Malaysia, uh, who are members of this, who are have a bad record when it comes to transgender rights, may actively work 
to use this clause of culture and tradition to deny transgenderizing the future. However, the system is still not tested and maybe when it is actually tested, we'll see something different. The one thing that is left out of here is UPI and UPI plus 10, and you will find it in the report and like uh, overall like view of, of this like unique document that really works hard on advancing the rights of transgender people and LGBT people in general and so on. The, the last part of the report, if you look at it, you will find uh, something related more to national jurisdiction. And here we did, want, we did not want to restrict ourselves to national jurisdiction applying international regional human rights uh, uh, opinions directly, but also like national jurisdiction developing its own opinion on that, because we believe that cross, uh, cross national exchange between courts can help like uh, in advancing transgender rights globally and uh, If you will see like uh, at the document, we did not want to restrict ourselves to the main, like the one, the countries that are most famous for trans rights. So we will find there like the examples from the Philippines, Vietnam, China, Kuwait, Tunisia, Lebanon, and so on, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and South Africa and so on. So we did not want to restrict ourselves to Argentina, which is known for its uh, very progressive laws and policies or Malta, we, ex we expanded further into countries that may uh, still slow in adopting like full trans right, but we need to celebrate them to encourage them to go further with their with their advancements. So the first part you will find the talks about legal gender organization. And here you will find that uh, we the, the people who don't, are familiar with the term self identification, which uh, relates to people identifying by what they want to identify with without like legal or medical restrictions and so on. Uh, several countries have adopted this, as I mentioned before, Argentina and Malta have this kind of laws. Uh, we also have countries that India, for example, also like move towards like more of self uh, identification since the case of uh, NASA versus the Union of India. Then we have cases like Lebanon, um, Botswana and so on where the, the the system has moved from denying legal gender recognition for all trans people to starting to allow legal gender recognition for trans people who are fitting the binary so like trans binary trans woman and trans men and in the future hopefully these will open the gates for others um then like the most uh, like the issue that uh, i think a lot of the globally now has been like very constructed uh, rights of trans minors, especially like right to access gender affirming health care. And this issue is, is quite hard, like because like many countries have not adopted uh, policies or laws that allow trans minors to make informed decisions without the requiring the consent of the parents, which hinders th their access to transgender health care if the parent is against uh, against them having them. But we, we looked at Australia and the UK because they have their own policies that uh, that works to identify uh, like children that are capable of making from decision after doctor uh, approval. Sadly, this uh, this system has also came under scrutiny and like th there has been judicial processing and litigation against them, especially in the UK, as we know. But like, luckily, the high the high courts in the UK did say that this policy is correct and the trans minors can make informed decisions on their health care, but it still did undermine a lot. Uh, then we have like issues like, uh, like uh, inclusive education and legal gender organization for trans minors. Uh, sadly, since most countries uh, only do legal gender organization after surgeries, and so if you don't have access to gender affirming health care, you're not gonna have it for legal gender organization, but countries that have self ID, uh, there was cases like in, uh, in Argentina and so on uh, that allowed trans minors to have legal gender organization. Uh, when it comes to inclusive education, like we can like find like countries like uh, Philippines that have uh, enacted a very comprehensive anti bullying policy that was later turned into a law that protects LGBT like minors in schools and in facilities and so on. Uh, we can also find that in India that has the similar uh, thing and USA title IX. Uh, Brazil Supreme Court also had good decisions when it struck down uh, policies that I would undermine comprehensive uh, education that include LGBT identities. And Colombia did extend uh, like the rights uh, of uh, protection, right to education and protection of the not being denied education 
for people the pay based on their gender expression after like a non-binary person could not attend school because of school uniform policies and so on. Uh, and finally, the, the, the last part of the report, if you're, if you're following with us, you will find protection from abusive practices and discrimination. And here again, we looked at different countries globally uh, from different places and so on. We have like the and the discrimination laws that we know of, like in, in Western Europe, for example, in Canada and the US, but also we wanted to look at like countries that still like working towards that. Uh, last year, Quit Supreme Court decriminalized a law that was impacting LGBT people, uh, transgender people, especially uh, for imitating the opposite sex. Uh, court in Zimbabwe also found like the government in violations after like a, a trans uh, person was subjected to humiliation and ill treatment amounting to torture in the detention and also arbitrary detention. Uh, China had like a unique case, like a unique case last year as well that looked uh, looked at uh, discrimination in the workplace and so on. And finally, we looked at uh, co conventional therapy and we looked there at Canada, Bill C4, and also Vietnam, which both have uh, criminalized forced conversion therapy on transgender people in the past years. So this is an overview of the publication. Uh, as I said, like there is more, more details, more information. It's a very in-depth uh, and uh, we're looking forward for your questions, and I'm I re I risk my case now, Erica, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. And I just want to remind everyone that you you can post questions in the Q and A box uh, there, um, and we'll be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Also, there you can find the link to the report itself. We are going to proceed with our panelists, and with us we have today. Um, Three panelists will be joining us for a discussion. So we have Levan, uh, who is uh, the Gender Movement Program Officer at GATE. Um, uh, Levan is a queer feminist activist from the Republic of Georgia. They are a graduate of the Social Justice and Human Rights uh, Program at Arizona State University and the Gender Studies Program at Central European University. And Levan has vast experience in LGBTQI and feminist movements in the Eurasia region, which spans over nine years. Also with us, we have our uh, founder and previous executive director, a great honor to have you with us, Mauro. Mauro Cabral Greenspan is GPP's Senior Officer for Gender Justice and Equity. He joined GPP in March 2022 to coordinate the Task Force on Trans and Intersex Funding and the Task Force on Philanthropic Response to Anti-Gender Ideology. Uh, he's an Argentinian intersex and trans advocate currently living in Brussels. Before, in, before joining GPP, Mauro had a long career as civil society organizer and human rights expert. He co-founded GATE in 2009, serving as its co-director between 2009 and 2017 and its e executive director between 2017 and 2022. Mauro also coordinates international initiative on trans, gender diverse, and intersex depathologization, participated in the elaboration of the Yogyakarta Principles and of the um, Yogyakarta Principles Plus 10 being a signatory of both. He also participated in the process of passing uh, the Argentinian Gender Identity Law and co-authored the Argentinian Bill on the Comprehensive Protection of Sex Characteristics. Maro has received the Bob Apple Equality Awards in 2015 and has been recognized for his work on sexual health and rights by WPAT and by University of Minnesota. He has a degree in history and pursued graduate studies in philosophy and gender studies. He currently serves as an ad honorem scientific collaborator at the Brussels Free University. Maro, welcome. Um, and uh, finally, uh, but not least, we have um, uh, Jamie Vernalde, uh, 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 who is the Senior Research on Global Advocacy and Policy. Jamie is a Senior um, Research and Global Advocacy and Policy Team at IPES. She monitors transnational anti rights movements and their connections and impacts in global spaces and at local level on sexual and reproductive health and rights and the rights of historically marginalized populations. 
She has over 12 years experience in qualitative human rights research, policy analysis, advocacy with multicultural and bilateral agencies and partnering with civil society organizations. Before joining IPAS in September 2021, Jamie conducted research on the impact of the US global gag rule in East and West Africa and in prior roles, investigated human rights violations and crackdowns on civil society in East Africa and the Caribbean. Jamie is fluent in, English, in French and is based in Washington, D.C. What a great panel we have today. Thank you all for joining us. And let's kick start with Levan. Uh, Levan, just I, I uh, would be helpful for you to share with our viewers um, why the importance of this publication, how did Gate decide to prioritize this publication and how it can be useful at regional, at country level for activists on the ground? Yeah, thank you, Erica. And thank you, Nora, by the way, for doing this amazing review and working for us with, um, with Gate and doing this amazing um, overview of the presentation that you did today. So basically the idea, um, the creation of this publication stems from the ongoing circulation of disinformation surrounding trans people and their rights, which has led to confusion among potential allies and power holders. Um, Anti-gender movements actively seek to undermine the legitimacy of trans activists by portraying them as exclusive, secretive entities with dangerous hidden agendas. They often frame trans rights as mere topics of debate between different rights holders or as a matter of free speech. And regrettably, key power holders within human rights institutions, international organizations, multilateral agencies, INGOs, foundations, and academia often fail to adopt visible and firm stances in support of trans rights. Uh, part of the problem lies in the normalization of anti-trans attacks by these anti-gender actors who present their arguments as rights-based concerns aimed at protecting people's safety. Consequently, it appears as though trans rights must be weighed against the rights or protection of others, such as women and children, for example, uh, <coughs> despite the fact that this contradicts fundamental human rights principles of indivisibility and inalienability. Uh, within international policy spaces and many national contexts, there exists a silent majority that is not inherently transphobic, but rather uncertain or uninformed. And it provided with accurate information, reassurance, and stronger arguments to show visible support, these individuals would, like, would likely adopt supportive positions. Therefore, by dismantling and reinforcing existing human rights norms, we hope to influence people's perception of what is right and socially just. Um, this publication serves as a crucial tool in addressing these challenges, enabling us to counter disinformation and provide clarity to potential allies and power holders and promote a more informed and supportive stance on trans rights. And the way it can be used is, so basically the primary goal of this publication is well, to articulate how existing international human rights standards can be applied to protect the rights of trans people across various themes that are frequently targeted by anti-gender actors at both the international and national levels. By doing so, we aim to establish clear policy boundaries and provide guidance on high-level responses, thereby ensuring clarity for, for potential allies and policymakers. Um, the report specifically addressed key themes such as children and young people's rights, education, healthcare, sport, justice, and important program areas of NGOs, like access to sexual and productive health and rights and gender-based violence services. That, um, these themes often serve as focal points for discussion or attack by anti-gender uh, movements. Um, by outlining how international and regional human rights standards can be instrumental in addressing these challenges faced by trans people, this publication empowers activists policymakers and other stakeholders in the fight against anti-gender actors and their narratives. It sheds light on the positive progress that has already been made within international, regional and national mechanisms concerning trans rights. Um, and though it's comprehensive analysis and practical insights, the publication equips individuals and organizations with the knowledge and tools necessary to leverage human rights frameworks in advocating for it and advancing the rights of trans individuals at regional and country levels. 
Um, by utilizing this publication, um, stakeholders can strengthen their arguments, engage in evidence-based advocacy, and promote inclusive policies that uphold the rights and dignity of trans people. Ultimately, we hope that it contributes to building a more equitable and just society where trans individuals can fully exercise their rights and live free from um, discrimination. Thank you very much, Levan. Um, and just a reminder to our viewers today uh, who have kindly joined us, Post your questions using the Q&A option. Uh, there's the button there and you can post your questions. We will have time to address your questions um, after uh, the panelists. Uh, we're gonna move to Mauro. Uh, and Mauro, you've been uh, in the response uh, for some time and you've had a lot of experience, particularly you know, in international, regional, national mechanisms. How effective can international and regional mechanisms be in the response to anti-gender attacks? Thank you very much, uh, Erika, and thank you, you know, colleagues uh, from GATE for uh, the invitation and also for sharing the, the report. The, the, this question for me had two different two different answers. So for the for the first one. Um, I would say that since trans activists started uh, engaging with the UN back, you know, the beginning of the 2000s, there was a, a huge uh, hope and also like a strong belief in that the international human rights system uh, was going to be an extremely useful tool to advance the human rights of trans people around the world. and during many years, our movement have uh, built um, different forms of relationship by engaging with treaty bodies and also with special procedures, uh, engaging with the officer of the high of the high commissioner, and the same processes that um, that have uh, happened at the international level um, were also. Uh, not replicated, but let's say happened like in, in parallel with regional human rights systems, especially at the European level and the Latin American level. And from the very beginning, it was very clear that many people and institutions, uh, both at the regional and the international human rights uh, level, were interested in talking about sexual orientation, but not that interested in talking about gender identity. So from the very beginning, gender identity issues and all the issues like gender expression, for example, posed by trans activists occupied a secondary place in the attention of international and regional human rights activists. That has started to change at some point, for example, around the creation of the of the SOGI mandate, you know, and, and I would say that between the Jakarta principles in 2000, between 2006 and 2007, and the Jakarta principle plus 10 in 2017, I had the impression, and maybe it was a naive impression, we can discuss that, that we were winning, and actually that these systems we're going to be uh, a key space for trans activists around the world to get support to resist the attacks uh, by anti-gender by anti-gender actors. But what we are seeing over the last five six years is that the same spaces that we believe that were our allies are being invaded and are being uh, co-opted in some in some cases by the same anti-gender actors that we are facing and there are two key examples of that like in the inter-american system for example the very sad uh, example of elizabeth uh, odio benito who is uh, the um the president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, who in a case that is addressed in the report, like Vicky Hernandez uh, versus Honduras, for example, produced a document expressing that the Convention uh, for the Eradication of Violence Against Women in the Inter-American inter System, the Convention do Belendo Pará, uh, shouldn't be applied to protect the, right, the human rights of trans women because the Convention was created to protect the rights of 
uh, cis women or in her perspective, natural women. At the international level, we are seeing how the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women is continually uh, using the human rights system against the human rights of trans people. And I have to say that this is like a shocking realization that I believe that there is a lot of ground still for trans people to use national, uh, regional, and, and international human rights mechanisms to support or uh, human rights struggles, but at the same time, that these human rights mechanisms are part of the battleground uh, or in the battle uh, against anti-gender um, movements, and that it are being used by these movements to attack on human rights uh, around the world. Actually, uh, human rights, um, the human rights system, like operating at these um, different um, levels, is playing a key role in redefining the human part in human rights, considering that only men and women, what we would call cis men and women, count as humans, that trans people deserve a different system of rights, and actually that human rights are scarce, which means that there are not enough human rights for everyone, and that the human rights of cis men and women have priority over the human rights of trans people, and that if trans people are fully recognized as human and arise as human rights, that is dangerous, particularly for cis women, and, and also for cis gay and lesbians. So um, at this moment, as I said, I don't fully know how to respond to your uh, to your question. I would love to respond to this question five years ago and saying, of course, you know, uh, we can count on the human rights system. Right now, we still need to count on the human rights system, but as a goal, it's still an horizon and it's something that we can debate. Like that if we are uh, if we were worse 20 years uh, ago, or is our situation is more even more complicated uh, now, when we are not only victims of human rights violations, but we are actively accused, you know, in, before, in front of these human rights mechanisms of being the perpetrators of human rights against women and children just by existing. So in that sense, you know, being the same people in the same community facing the same issues and still, you know, requesting the, the, the ground zero of human rights just to be recognizing, recognized in our own gender with our own names. We have this, you know, complete inversion going from being considered victims of wrong human rights violations to being considered criminals, uh, torturers perpetrators of sexual of sexual abuse. So um, this is <laughs> what I'm going to say uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauro. And I think it's uh, some very, very uh, key reflections there for everyone. You know, the, the impression that we were winning, that's something that we, we, we need to analyze and remember. The strides we're making, are we really winning? Are we really moving forward? given the situations now um or are we actually losing are we actually taking step backwards and we need to take that from its perspective and i think we also need to to really reflect on the issue uh, around human rights and and the perception and and not only the perception but the lived reality of some trans people around how scarce they find human rights and that their human rights are not respected. Thank you very much, uh, Mauro. I'm going to move on quickly to uh, Jamie. And, and Jamie, uh, we would love to hear from you in the work that you do. What tendencies and issues do you see in relation to anti-gender movements globally? Thank you, and, and thank you for the invitation. I mean, I, I'm coming from a from a very traditional, one might say feminist, SRHR organization. Um, so I appreciate being invited into this space. And hello to everyone. I'm actually going to keep my remarks rather short because I feel like, thank you, Nora, for this report, Levon and Mauro for just providing the context. I think to to Mauro's point, this, this mo moment that I think a lot of us felt, and as much as I would like to blame everything on Trump in 2016, just 
that it was this opening of attacks on the human rights system that occurred, that having some key governments, notably the U.S., actively subverting the U.N. system and the U.N. human rights system, I think has allowed for more vocalization of anti-LGBTI, anti-SRHR, anti-abortion, anti-rights broadly, and this hardening and return to these binaries that that Mauro talked about, that we, I think collectively, there was this slide back that we're seeing. And the example that Mauro provided of the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, who's not only weaponizing trans people and her, her attacks, um, but also actively undermining civil society, including traditionally feminist allies, I would say, and just ignoring their calls that she is misusing her position. So I think just this, this personalization of the human rights system with certain actors. Um, and then we, we talked a little bit, Nora laid out, you know, the, the tensions that you see at the UN and in the spaces between the, the system and the member states. Um, Nora spoke a little bit about the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, um, also the African bloc. We're seeing how key and for the most part U.S. and also European, but also Latin American as well and other non-state actors are infiltrating those spaces and have been for some time. But again, I would say, as Mauro said, the last five to six years are really gaining ground in those spaces and using trans rights um, and this. I'm stealing a term that GPP has used quite often in the report, moral panic around ch child protection, that trans rights are an affront to child protection, um, that abortion, of course, is subverting the rights of children and parents, and all of these same narratives that we're hearing more and more. So unfortunately, this fits into these larger attack on human rights um, and these key organizations that are really looking towards talking about men and women, those binaries, um, and really undermining what we have come to accept as, as fundamental human rights, as, as Levon said, that it's just the human rights for some, and the, the, the few who are able to define what those human rights are. Um, a good example is, is CSW, um, the Commission on the Status of Women that occurred a few months ago, where some of these key anti-rights, anti-gender organizations were actively working to attack anything related to gender. Gender is now this buzzword that whether it's gender sensitive, gender transformation anywhere equals trans rights. And they use that and they weaponize that at every chance they get to send us back to language. I mean, 2014 language isn't acceptable. They're trying to really undermine basic human rights framework language that has been accepted since since 1994. Um, and that's, so yeah, unfortunately, I feel like I'm invited into these spaces and I always say, yeah, it's, it's terrible everywhere. And trans rights are just now the, the space and the term that is used to atta attack everything, um, I would say. So I'm, I feel like I didn't really add anything more. I was gonna mention more about the um, special rapporteur, but Mauro got to it first. Um, um, and it's just, it's, it's seeing in all these spaces. And I think a highlight of this report, Nora, is just also seeing where there are opportunities and, and really trying to call on allies to actually be so much more bold. Um, there's always this waffling in these spaces of what can be said for negotiation purposes, but I think we need to hold them to account that if they are allies, governments, um, and key champions really need to be speaking out a lot more and, and not letting things like what's happening with this special rapporteur to just slide under the radar for expediency and for, for face saving. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there so that we can get to get some questions. Hey, Jamie, and um, I'm gonna open now the Q&A. So if anyone has questions, please type it in the Q&A. But first, before we move, um, I want to, to, to just give Mauro a couple of minutes to share, uh, uh, because you coordinate the task force on philanthropic responses to anti-gender ideology, just to share some updates on what is what you are working on there and what we can expect. Uh, uh, I would say that 
uh, we're facing a problem, right, in this in the context of that that source, and it has to do with an issue that maybe is going to be more familiar to those of you who are trans activists or working on trans issues. And for many years, there were donors uh, funding responses to anti-gender movements, considering that anti-gender movements were what we can consider conservative or traditional anti-gender movements, those associated with governments in the far right of the political spectrum and, and with religious uh, institutions. But now we have anti-gender actors that are coming from within the feminist uh, movement and also from groups like the LGB Alliance. So groups that defend rights based on sexual orientation and attacks rights based on gender identity and gender expression. And that creates certain confusion because in some countries, some conservative slash traditional anti-gender actors are quite powerful. Let, let's think about Uganda or Hungary, right? Or Russia or um, Nicaragua. But in other countries, let's say the UK, for example, these feminist LGB anti-gender actors are extremely powerful and we are seeing their actions all around the world. And we see that because of the actions of these actors, it's becoming increasingly easy to uh, question uh, gender identity laws be uh, based on self-determination, including, for example, in countries like in Argentina that passed its law in 2012. So what we see is that once uh, donors uh, still have to catch up saying how complex the anti-gender movement is and actually that they are groups uh, that are uh, progressive because they define themselves as feminists, for example, but at the same time endorse anti-gender actions. We are going to see more of that awareness in donors and I hope that for the next couple of years, these uh, anti-gender feminist groups are going to receive less and less support. Um, we are going to see do a big donor convening probably next year, focus on, on anti-gender issues in general. At this moment, GPP is conducting uh, research on the available resources for the philanthropic response to anti-gender anti issues. But so there are many positive advances. And one that for me is particularly concerning, which is that because anti-gender actors are taking trans uh, people as a key target, many donors consider that if they are funding responses to anti-gender, they are also funding trans issues. Or if they are funding trans, they are also funding responses to anti-gender. And part of our wor uh, work is trying to convince them that actually the two funding streams are necessary, that not all anti-gender work is pro-trans and that trans organizations require still support to be uh, funded. So I hope that in the future, we are going to see an increase in the available money for trans groups to do specific work on anti-gender issues uh, without having to count on the general operating uh, funding or the funding to do other kind of work, um, like, for example, access to treatment. The thing that I would love to share is that they are going to be much more money. But as you know, uh, <laughs> getting more money for trans movements is one of the key challenges that we have. So with GATE and with other uh, partners, we're starting the process of doing a new research of the state of the, of the movement, of the trans and the intersex movement. And I hope that all activists and organizations present in this, in this uh, call will uh, engage with that research when the survey is, is out to see how um, the anti-gender movement is affecting trans funding and trans organizing. So that's also something that is going to happen to happen soon. Thank you very much, Mauro, and some very exciting news there. And hopefully uh, we will be able to see progress on, on, the, on all those issues, but also some things that really worry us and keep, keep us awake at night, like the lack of funding, which is, has been a big issue for all trans-led organizations globally. We have a couple of questions from uh, our viewers. And there's uh, two questions that are related. So I'm, I'm gonna post both of them 
together. One is how we can build a collaboration for trans activism to establish a, a committee on elimination, uh, elimination of discrimination against trans people. And how can we build more cross-movement solidarity, given that trans rights and women's reproductive rights are equally under threat at the moment? Um, if any of you want to take those questions. So any ideas for our viewers on how we can build more cross-movement solidarity? I know it's a big question there. Erica, I can I can answer a bit, but like uh, I would answer based on like one context, I would say that because this is a big question and I can give you an answer that broad like that works in every context. But let's say like uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, where I'm originally from, the region where I'm from, uh, there has been slow inclusion in mainstream human rights on trans rights. And I'm going to be honest and blunt with you that this is mostly came from the funding opportunities that mainstream human rights noticed that there is a funding opportunities for trans programming and they wanted part two of this conversation that made them expand their programming into trans rights as well. It's not the best approach because it's not genuine, of course, but it does create like more conversation and discussion among like these mainstream organizations and it did fuel more trained activists from the region that we now have in the region, capable trans-led organizations that were separated from the, these main, main human rights organization. But this was in the context where there was none to begin with. And, and now I would say the trans movement is really working hard to intersect it, its work, especially with uh, people that share same values when it comes to feminist issues and so on. Uh, but of course, it's harder in this context of the region where conservative uh, views and like social binary is very dominant and is really influencing the mainstream human rights. But so it's it's a it's a challenge, but it's it's a winnable battle because in the end of the day, people realize that you can't have human rights without trans people, and in the end of the day, you can't have one human rights over the other. So they they will col collaborate with you. You just need to keep on fighting more or less. Um, Thank you. Go ahead, Mara. To add to that to that question, I believe like the three things are necessary. Like one is to build solidarity between the two these two sectors, but also like real I don't know to call it solidarity, but political awareness that this is an attack against different communities at the same time. So like many people are at risk, and these movements have these are are rooted in the strong fear against everything that looks different, including migrants, including like a different racialized uh, minorities. We need to go beyond the LGTBI silo or the sexual and reproductive rights, you know, and create big political alliances. The second is trying to, to find some common denominators. I believe that sometimes we are extremely divided because of very tiny differences. And this is a moment to build, I believe, like huge alliances based on certain, like the topics that we can agree on. And the, th the third one is that we need to build solidarity, but among everything, I believe that we need to build strategies, like concrete strategies, including strategies around elections, like or movements sometimes tend to be I understand, and I understand and share that, you know, hypercritical with engaging with the state, engaging in processes of legal reform, engaging with, with donors, all of that, it's okay. But, but I really believe that this is a moment to, you know, to take a seat and strategize together, like how we take power back, basically, in a moment which each government counts. And, and I would say, like, especially the US, I mean, the US is important in the same sense that Sweden is uh, important, or the Netherlands, or Argentina, or Spain, uh, or Uganda, we are seeing that uh, we need candidates, including candidates to be the next independent expert uh, SOGI, or we need candidates for the mandate of the, of the Special Reporter on Women. 
So this is a moment to work to get pe key people in key places and to ensure that we have as much control as possible, even you know, at the UN level on treaty bodies, on the special procedures, in the uh, regional human rights systems. It's a moment with a strategy counts and not only solidarity. Thank you very much, uh, Mauro. We're running out of time. So I'm gonna pose a question and I want, uh, if, I would appreciate if all of you would chip in to the question. So there is a question about how to engage at the local level, particularly with UN systems. I just want to expand the questions to also to human rights mechanism at the national level. What advice do you have for activists in their engagement? with human rights mechanism and UN mechanisms at the national level. Let's start with Nora. Thank you, Erica. I would say you need to do your homework before meeting anyone. You need to understand what their priorities were and what your strategy is in and find entry point and intersectionality that you can work with. If you're going to meet with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, for example, then you need to focus on the, the needs on challenges that faces trans refugees. If you're gonna meet uh, the uh, like the National Human Rights Committee uh, that is uh, specialized in the health, you need to focus on that. But it's it's very important to understand the persons that you're gonna meet with and do be pragmatic, pragmatic and realistic. Uh, some, especially like in context where you know that there is hostility, like towards trans individuals and trans rights. Like as I said, we examine context that not only uh, like uh, bright and trans rights. So if we go to sub-Saharan Africa or North Africa or Southeast Asia and so on, it's harder to engage with these in a public events. But you will find someone who's willing to, to talk to you beyond closed door because they need to have this conversation. As Mario said, it's, it's not only act of solidarity, especially you in missions because they are required. So you need to understand that this is their job and they're not doing it. This is not a favor. This is their job and they need to understand that their job needs to include trans people because this is their mandate. So just do your homework and be optimistic with the people you engage with. Thank you very much, Dora. Jamie, would you like to add? I think I just want to add that we have, we have to remember that if I can call them opposition, but anti gender actors, anti-rights actors at the local level are not shy. They are in these spaces, they are meeting with these people, they are coming to the UN in New York and Geneva to do this work. And likewise, we need to be bold. And perhaps, uh, certainly to Nora's point, know who your interlocutors are, know that whoever you're talking to at the national level might be very, very different in terms of their outlook than who is at Geneva or the UN and negotiating. So it's it's doing these things that Nora is talking about. It's understanding who they are and also doing a little bit of research and knowing who else is speaking to them. Um, and that goes with the building of alliances that we talked about before is that know who they are, the, the opposition, the anti-gender movement, but know who else from SRHR, from women's rights who are allies so that it's not just, I think, this, this breaking of silos that we're talking about because what the opposition does well is that they have one they have one point that we are going after their children that we are we are the threat and that extends to as Mauro said everything from bottle autonomy to elections and they are mobilizing on that and i think the more we come together to do this work in partnership the stronger we are thank you very much Jamie Levan would you like to share some advice yeah i would agree with all of that has been said and one of the things that I would probably add is that um, I think whenever we are um, um, activists are engaging with the UN agency at the national level, <coughs> as Nora said, they need to do their homework, which means that we need to understand what their competences are, like for each UN agency that we're engaging with, who are those people who are, um, we're engaging with, what are their ideologies and stances, and also like, what are what is what are their mandates? What are they tasked with? And and also understanding of what our expectations are in terms of maybe in certain contexts, engaging with the UN might not be even productive, it might be counterproductive, or maybe engaging with not this agency or another agency might be more productive because there are people, sometimes it boils down to individuals that are working in specific uh, departments that are more progressive and are more willing to support than 
the other ones. So understanding the what expectations one has and what capacities and what opportunities exist and what is a local context is always very important because it might be very productive, but it also it might create some backlash. Um, and also, as, as Jamie said, definitely, um, there might be some actors who are supportive of trans rights who can facilitate this access to the UN agencies, like other larger feminist groups, anti-racist groups, or other groups that might be sympathetic of, of the activism that trans people are doing in the country, who might help to reach to these agencies that are relevant for the specific goal. Thank you very much, Levan. And finally, with you, Maro, any advice you would like to share? Yeah, I, I would like to echo what Levan said. Uh, working on anti-gender issues can be exhausting personally and also organizationally. You don't need to do it alone. So in all countries, there are people working on this, working regionally, working internationally. You want to do it nationally, look support from trans organizations, LGTBI organizations, feminist organizations. I believe that working together is the best way of being more effective and at the same time to protecting and taking care of ourselves and of our organizations. Thank you very much, Mauro. Thank you, Nora, Jamie, Levan. And thank you for everyone who joined us today for this webinar. And, you know, take home messages, you know, do your homework, understand your expectations, capacities, partnerships, work together. You don't have to do it alone. In fact, you are not alone in this. <laughs> That's definitely the truth. And uh, please engage, work together, collaborate. Remember, you're not alone. We are in this together. Thank you. Have a great day. And thank you for everyone that joined us.